Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rocket Lasso Live, episode 15. Rocket Lasso Live is a Patreon-supported live stream I do every single Wednesday in order to answer questions that people have, mostly about Cinema 4D, and the questions come in form the form of typed out questions or usually links to a video on Instagram or Twitter or Patreon, some cool effect, some photo of some model that they are curious about how it might be made, and we just try and tackle it live and figure it out right in front of you. So uh, we've already got some links going here, so we want to jump on in and do those. So let's, let's see what we got. Oh, look at this. Uh, this is random type projects from Muo Muoka Studio, Muoka? Could be just Mocha Studio. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, well, look at that. I want to look at all these. Uh, nice. Nice. Oh, look at that one. That one's cool. Um, look at all these. This is great. Ooh, I love that one. It's got such a nice pop. Like, it's almost like that one. That one's intentionally watermelon, sort of chocolate. Like, they just look delicious. Wow, this is some. Really, really, really nicely designed type. I like it a lot. But you are specifically asking about the first one. The first one is the trickiest one. Um, look at these crazy colors. I feel like... <sighs> hmm... The only way to do this, any kind of colors like this, tends to be on a real, well, thin film or some really, really nice background. But I've never, I only try and tackle this during the live stream, so I've never done it in a lot more detail where I've really tried to research it and figure out how something like this is made. And I don't have more information, I don't have like this deeper level of information to give. So it's always like, well, let's try thin film. And then it sort of works, is where we always end up on these type of questions. And that's what our limitations are in physical. And then it makes me think that you pro maybe you can make something that looks really great here, like this in Octane or in Arnold or in Redshift. And, you know, maybe there's just a really nice thin film shader in there or, or the equivalent that would give you something really nice looking. And I just have zero knowledge on it whatsoever. Um, and yeah, oh yeah, uh, Zach is saying to look up dispersion and redshift under refraction. So yeah, like doing light dispersion so that as they refract through, it starts going in different directions. And I mean, we can, I am so not an expert in redshift that we can spend a minute tinkering in there, but no promises. Um, so let's just go and create a couple of shapes for ourselves that we can be refracting. So a torus could probably give us some interesting shapes. In fact, why don't we make a torus? I'm going to put a twist on it. It's a torus with a twist. We'll put the twist on it, and I'm going to fit the parent, and we'll spin that 180. That should be a funky shape. So we'll do that. And we can make a bit of text extruded. Let's make a mm, uh, helix is just a really quick way of doing it. I don't want to use a helix though. Um, I want a nice swirly line, but there's no good way of making that. Um, so we'll do that, and I'll grab the point, and pull it up, and grab the point, and pull it up, and grab the point, and pull it up, and grow, and shrink, and grow, and up and shrink and grow and I really don't like that too much and now we say soft and it's terrible scale it down to something slightly more reasonable and we'll say soft again almost something soft and then we'll not close it Oh, it's not closed already. Where's the opening? They're too close to each other. They're tricking me. And then we'll sweep some text. 
Sweep and text. And we'll just make a nice old ampersand out of a nicer font. Um, Futura is the rocket lasso font. Let's go ahead and put that in the sweep. Nice. So that's sweeping around. It gets a little weird over there. Not sure why. Grow, 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 grow. Invert, delete. Oof. Tricky stuff. Why is it breaking on the end there? Or is it? Oh, it's just twisting in itself. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Cool. Good enough. Good enough. Good enough. Zoom. I just have not passed through itself so much. Oh man. What is even happening here? All right, that was uh, a little bit more trouble than it was worth, but whatever. We got some we got some stuff to refract here. Um, so with these the way they are, let's go and grab that and we'll add some twists into it. Zoom. That's weird. That text not sent. I mean, we can say middle. That might spin a little better. Well, a little better. Okay, that just makes everything worse. So we're gonna ignore that. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, I'm assuming we're gonna need something to light and reflect. So we're gonna make a redshift dome light, and we're gonna add a grayscale gorillas plugin HDRI link, just so we can drop the dome map on there, and we're gonna give ourselves something to reflect. And I've been enjoying the skies. I was looking, I was requesting skies for a long time. So we'll do sky 37 there. And let's go ahead and give this a quick save. Let's see, what did someone in the chat say? Yeah. What did you say? Yeah, just dispersion. So let's just say red. Shift dispersion. Alrighty, so let's make a new redshift material. La, 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 la. One of these is, I'm just going to say material. I'm pretty sure there's a preset inside of the material for water or glass. There we go. Glass. Excellent. So we don't have to go and completely build it from scratch. Let's go ahead and apply that. Let's make another boring redshift material to apply to the ground and let's just make sure that that is working so far by making opening up redshift render view hitting go and there we go it's refracting quite nicely and look how nice that looks already man and look how quick it is like just imagine how long it takes to do in physical it's insane how, what the third party renders have done for us so there we go we get this nice refraction look at all the stuff we're getting practically for free all right so now we need to go into our redshift material here and we need to look for dispersion. So we've got a refraction. Um, I'm just gonna click around a little bit, see if I can naturally find it. Uh, well, there's dispersion right there, it's just a setting. So I have no idea what amount might do something, but oh, look at that, colors are being introduced right away. So let's push that crazy style. Dispersion. Blink! Oh, that's interesting. Wow, okay. Smaller numbers have a bigger effect than bigger numbers. So it must be the equivalent of thin wall. Well, or like, uh, yeah, the thin film. If you turn on thin walled, then that makes the entire thing act as if it's just like a bubble. But this dispersion seems to automatically introduce that color. It's linked to reflection right now. We can probably do some funky things by combining different index of refractions um, and different levels of dispersion. But yeah, this is, at this point, look, it's just a slider. As we do the slider, we're introducing these rainbow colors and we're getting that pretty much for free. Um, and without, uh, I don't even have to have any understanding over what's happening and we're getting cool, colorful results out of that. So if you were to actually have some understanding of what that does, so we've got dispersion here, but you know potentially you can get some more interesting things if you change the dispersion over distance. Um, yeah, keep it low. 
Um, and yeah, why don't you go real low? Yeah, oh, yeah, even that, like as I go lower and lower, so why don't we go the smallest possible number, zero, zero, one. Oh, nope, so you need a little something. So 0.1 seems to give us the strongest kind of rainbowy look. Yeah, that's interesting. And I mean, take that into Photoshop, crank up the vibrance, and you you got yourself a stew. Um, so yeah, I mean, man, that looks cool. And but it's just a slider, so like we don't get any special credit for that. Um, now we do have dispersion here. I mean, there's always the possibility we could go into our shader graph and then feed in some sort of noise to modify that, which could get weird. Let's, let's try that. I don't even know what happened, but I'm just curious if we can. Let's make a redshift noise, and then we have our redshift material. And if we go into somewhere, we're going to find our diffusion. So that's under refraction. Refraction transmission, which is here. Um, oh, does it not give us that? We have the, um, the IOR. Refractive aberration? Is that what that one stands for? That's weird. Why is it giving us... Um, I don't see a refractive aberration anywhere here, so I'm just curious what that is. Plink. Does that do anything? Doesn't look like it did anything. Yeah, weird stuff. Um, yeah, I thought I thought maybe we could control different numbers in there by, by feeding it, but it doesn't seem like that's actually a parameter inside of that node. Which is a little weird to me. Can you drag it in like that? Well, that's oh, it is refractive aberration. So, <laughs> so dispersion is the name of it here. And I was like, well, refractive aberration sounds like the same idea. And as I dragged it over, it renamed it to that parameter. So those are the same ones. That's pretty funny. Uh, I'm glad I at least have a base level of understanding on this kind of stuff. Um, so like it seems to have died it did die there it uh it turned itself off i'm not sure why it didn't crash it was still up it just stopped running so i'm not sure what was uh what was up with that uh that's too bad you missed a you missed a little a funny a funny thing here i was trying to figure out how what uh what our setting would be here underneath uh, refraction and transmission and there is no dispersion in here, but we did have refractive aberration. I was like, well, that sounds like the kind of thing that would be doing something similar. So I tried driving it. I was like, well, that doesn't seem to be the right parameter because it didn't do anything. So then I dragged this over to see if that would work in Redshift. And it does, but you'll see that dispersion is actually refractive aberration. Why are they named differently in the interface and in the node? That's so weird. But uh, that plugging this in doesn't visually really seem to change much. And so I can't think of any way of making that more vibrant than it is already. But if we go back to our reference, um, I don't know, like that might literally be all we're really seeing in here. Uh, you take this image and we, um, you know, just as the super duper quickest version here, um, taking a screenshot of that. Oh yeah, and our Photoshop crashed. We're having some crashing troubles today, everybody. Now I was doing a lot of rendering with Cinema earlier, so maybe it like ate up all the RAM and everything. I didn't restart, but, um, but still a little weird. Um, I'll let that finish opening. Oh, there we go. It did finish opening. But yeah, if just by taking our image as simple as it is there in the Photoshop, if we were to just create a vibrance here and really crank up that vibrance, like you're going to really start getting those colors popping in a way that could account for a lot of the really fun color that we're seeing here. So, yeah, you see these same kind of mirrored stripes, and we just get them there. So I, it's just a setting I literally never touched before, and pulling it up a little bit gives us a really nice uh, nice effect overall on it. So it could be as simple as that. So what makes these amazing, of course, is all of the great design in them. Like, every single one of these is better than the last one. Oh, this one's my favorite. Man, I do not have a brain that does this kind of stuff. Like, who decided that, like, oh, let's do some splattery pokey dots behind it, and that's going to make it look cool? Because it does. It does look cool. Look at that. And even look at this patterning is super interesting. Like, none of these dots intersect with each other. So that makes me think that this is something like uh, if this was made in cinema, that you're actually, these are actually a series of clones being cloned to create this pattern um, so that they're not intersecting with each other, like that kind of thing. Because in the material, they wouldn't be... Uh, all randomly spaced out really nicely like that. And I don't see a single dot that's interacting with an, or bumping into another one. So yeah, always interesting details. Um, and yeah, adding, adding more, 
Tobias adding more lights in there, I definitely think would brighten it up. Adding in redshift lights, which I'm once again not super familiar with, or uh, going into our light here, if we were to grab one of the lights that is like way brighter in our HDR, then that could really brighten this thing up. And depending on the angle we're at, yeah, you can see the kind of bright light beams coming through, really going catching the illumination through it. Um, and man, just that refraction is, uh, look how quick, look how nice like everything looks um, so quickly inside the third-party renderers. Pretty great. I mean, I am glad I'm starting to uh, to learn them. This brighter light did not seem to help, though. I almost feel like we want something darker. Something with heavy contrast might work better. So just for fun, I'm going to go to my old-school favorite, which was Derelict 1, which gives us those overhead lights. And, yeah, now, now we have darker areas and lighter areas and more things to refract. And then with a more colorful scene for it to refract, we're automatically getting a lot more color in it naturally. So, you know, that automatically goes a really long way. We can probably go into our dome light, and I don't know this, but we can probably find the setting here that will stop it from rendering. Uh, yeah, I want it to affect all those. I just want it to be seen in the viewport. Dome light, share your graph. It's got to be here. Uh, enable background. There we go. Yep. So look at that. Look at these colors. The colors, Duke. The colors. That's amazing. And it's just a slider. And it's just a renderer. Like, I don't know what the math is that's doing this, but it's really cool. And there's probably ways of feeding in dispersion where you can put different channels in it. So you could probably disperse the red, green, and blue in different ways and get some really artistic control over it. But it's not something I'm familiar with. Um, so... Derelict 5. Wait, which one? What's the name of it? Uh, Derelict 1. Yeah, that's my favorite HDR. I, I just It gives you such direct overhead lighting, but it's still really bright. So it just is really good for catching these kind of really heavy contrast. So I'll give that one a quick save, and let's go see what we got next. Uh, Tobias is linking to an Instagram link. Hopefully it's for me, and hopefully Instagram is loading. Um, oh, is this just a... Uh, Oh, I think it's just a this is just a, a, a MoGraph meme. Yeah, this is the, oh, actually it's a meme Instagram. But yeah, if you're uh, <laughs> when you're a designer, do you use the pen tool or do you use the uh, the magic wand? Um, let's see. Uh, Viking. Uh, every time I use an align to spline tag on a camera, and the spline does a loop where the camera freaks out. Oh, that's an excellent question, and I even have an answer for you. So there is something called gimbal lock that you will always run into. Uh, and we can actually show this very well using your exact example. And this happens all the time to people. So let's go ahead and make an align to spline. And we're going to align our spline, our camera to our spline. I'm going to say tangential. And then you're going to see as our camera travels along, first of all, you see it's got this funky orientation right there. And then as we continue traveling along, there's going to be a certain point where the camera right there, Flip. You see how it flips 180 degrees? And this has to do, it might have to do with gimbal lock, but it's just kind of the orientation. And as a general rule, the simple solution is a rail spline. I'll make a second circle with it outlined. I'll put the rail spline in, and it's going to force the camera to aim at that orientation. And now as we travel around, you can see that it doesn't flip anymore. The rail spline gives it an orientation, so it actually knows which way to look. Now, if you wanted it to be pointing up, well, what I typically do is you see that I, I like increasing the radius like that. An alternative we could have done is grab this and pull it directly off to one side and then make that the rail spine. And then now you'll see it's always pointing on the inside. If I grab the rail spine and pull it on the opposite side, it'll always be pointing, I think, don't know this for sure, but it'll always be pointing on the outside successfully. But even along those lines, what I would typically do is just put the camera into a null, Alt-G, put that in a null, and then run this on, uh, run the uh, tag on the null, and now we can independently rotate our camera whichever way we want to. So now that would successfully travel around the outside. But if we wanted the camera to be looking left and right as it goes, um, I don't have anything easy on here. Why don't we just make a vibrate tag? Vibrate and or have it vibrate the rotation. Um, 30, 30, 30 is fine. Slow it down to 0.5. 
So now you can see that that can freely rotate around while our null is concerning itself with doing the traveling around. So at the time of zero, at the time of 90, and if we want to, we can select all the keyframes and set that to linear. And now that should be moving at a constant rate and it's not going to pop or flop around anywhere. And now it can also randomly be rotating as well. Um, speed that up a little so we can see a little better. Yeah, so you can see that rotating around, aiming around. And all we really needed was a rail spline. Whee! Excellent question though. I don't think that one deserves having a scene file saved. It's just the uh, idea of using a rail spline. Does that kind of uh, cover the uh, question? Um, let's see, Carlos, how to put the camera inside the object being it empty. Um, what object are we talking about, Carlos? Um, but in any case, uh, Drake, uh, you're interested in how to rig or jury rig a sequence where a emitter or X particles has an initial rate of one or two drops off by blah, blah, blah. Point. Oh, this is your question from a few weeks ago, and I still am not able to understand fully. You'd have to find some sort of footage. You find some sort of footage that is really close to what you're talking about, because... It sounds like you want them to, well, <laughs> Drake, uh, yes, reading it slowly, I might be able to get it. Reading out loud in a live stream is not the most exciting thing. Um, yeah, but there's, there's too much ambiguity, even, even the way you're asking it, because you say once the drop, in quotes, touches the bottom of the cube, it transforms into a liquid state. What, I, what does that mean? Does that mean it suddenly was a solid and suddenly bloop, it turned, it morphs into a liquid? Or does it mean um, that it's just like there's a liquid level on the bottom and it's moving upward a set amount every time a drop hits the bottom? Does it mean, um, does it mean like in a single frame flash, it's kind of faked and it's gone from one to another? There's a lot of ambiguity in the specifics there. Um, let's see, but we have another link to check out, uh, nine to 11 seconds in here, Coca-Cola contest from Corb. So let's see, well, let's, uh, pause this for a second. Do you, okay, we got a Coke on a pedestal. Blurp, whoa, I'm not sure what happened there. Oh, okay, I think I understand what's happening. Whoa, neat. <laughs> Cute. So I'm sure, I'm, I'm not hearing the audio, but I'm sure these are responding to certain tones. And each is doing their own thing. Um, I, uh, this is actually really straightforward um, to do some of the concept there. Uh, really all we have to do is um, modify... Um, modify the model in some parametric way. So that could be a morph. It could be a million different things. I wonder if I still have the bottle from one of the earlier Rocket Lasso Lives. So it's a really cool model that we made. Let me just take a second and I'm going to take a quick look here. See if I can find it because we could just work from that if we do have it. So I'm going to try episode one, scene files. Nope. Oh, episode one was the paint. And episode two seems more like it might have been. Nope. Let's try episode three. Let's check out episode four. It was one of the early ones. Pipe fun. Nope. Episode. If it's not in the next couple, then maybe it was uh, pre-Rocket Lasso Live. Waiting to the traveling log model. Fruit morph. Mm, interesting. Thought we would have hit it by now. Yeah, noodle cut. This is definitely happening after that. Eh. 
Um, let me think. What's I, I just I don't want to. I wonder if I have any of the. Um, do we have any built-in Cinema 4D models we can work from? Presets, um, broadcast, no, not uh, 3D objects. Yeah, maybe here. Um, celebration cookware. I would like to find something bottle-like glassware. Oh, look at that. There we go. Um, beer mug. There we go. That'll work. Not that that would have been hard to make, but there we go. We've got a model to work from. Although this is not very uh, even poly count. Let's go ahead and pull that material off for a second. You see what we got here. And uh, the polygons are being spent where they need to be, but I'd like our poly count to be a little more even. Luckily, this is a parametric object, so we can go ahead and set this to uniform and probably even chill that out a little bit. And uh, let's have this sweep not quite so many segments because, you know, we just don't need that many. Let's drop that down to 24 segments. And that can be even fewer there. No, well, now we can start getting to point. All right, we'll put a few extra. But I'd like them to be approximately square. There we go. Okay, so that's our basic beer mug. Nothing terribly fancy there. But if we, it's already zeroed out there, let's put in a couple different shapes in here so that we can um, modify it somehow. So let's go ahead and just put that into a null. I'm going to put a bulge in there and say fit the parent. Uh, it doesn't like that, so I'm going to put it down in here and say fit the parent. There we go. Now it matches. Pull it back out again. So this we can have go blurp and blurp bulge in and out and make some cool shapes that way. And then what else can we do? We can put a bend. We can put a twist, although we won't see the twist very clearly. So I guess a bend would work pretty well. Bend. We'll come bef No, the bend comes after the bulge. And then... Uh, a taper, why not? Fit the parent. There we go. And that comes before... That can come before the bulge. Okay, so here's the thought. If we make a... This will be number one. If we make a duplicate of that entire hierarchy, we'll hide the first for a second. And let's go ahead and do something funky with this one. Let's go ahead and taper it out. And we will bulge it in. And we will bend it like that. There we go. That's pretty fun, actually. So that is that is what happens on that shape. I'm going to visually hide our deformers. I don't want to see them. I just want our final model. So you can see that, that this is what we got going on. So with that in mind, all we have to do is make a MoGraph cloner. And we're going to put both of these inside of the cloner. So this could be doing any shape, any funky stuff, anything we want it to do. Uh, let's go ahead and put them side by side down a row and we'll make a couple extra okay so that becomes one row of these now we can go ahead and set these to blend and now you can see that we're actually slowly morphing from one shape to the other so that by itself is pretty cool we could take this one and bend it more or less and you know let's even do that let's have that bend over so we get all that you know that, there's a fun that's a fun funky transformy shape there but we can change this and let me see if i can remember i'm always a little fuzzy on it um we are blending between them, but if we go to, just give me a second, I'll remember. Um, we need to, I thought it was weight. We don't want to play fixed, I don't think is it. It's not time. How do we, fixed texturing, no. Mode multi instance, but blend is correct. Hmm, I know what it is. I know how to do this. I'm just blanking on the single setting somewhere. It's really not weight, it's like the only setting we have. Uh, okay, well, we might have to do it via an effector. If I make a plane effector, don't affect the position, but let's go. Okay, modify clone. There we go. So I'm going to make a modify clone, and now you can see if I drag this number anywhere. Uh, actually, if we go negative one. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to make one of them go negative one. Um, and now it is modified the clone, and they're all the, exactly the same. And now we can 
drive the rest of them. And that I might have changed that parameter. But if we go and we add in a random effector here, I'm going to tell this random effector that I want it to affect the modify clone. So you can see I've randomly modified two of those to randomly begin that morphing process to blend between them. So by changing, we've got a min and a max here. I'm going to pull this up to zero. So now this can be anywhere from zero up to the max. We can go to our, um, I guess there's no fall off in there. So we have to remap it, but there is no remapping. You know what? You know what? You know what? I shouldn't be. Uh, I should do this with a plane effector. Yeah, that makes more sense. I'm going to play a second plane effector, and the second plane effector is going to say that yes, I can modify the clone to be in the final position. And instead of driving it with a random effector, we now use a plane effector and drive it with a random fall off. Big difference between those two concepts. Uh, I don't like seeing that in the viewport. Okay. So now what we have happening is this random field is outputting anywhere from 0 to 100% strength. Uh, and if we change the field type to something like noise, and we give that some animation speed, then we can just hit play. And now these will be randomly wiggling around, transforming from one mode to another. We could remap that more strongly by going into the random field. And we can remap this however we want. We could do a minimum here. So they always have to be a little bit in or out. We could go to our um, our different shapes here. So we could go to quant or not quadratic. Let's go to uh, step. And now uh, it can only be in one mode or the other. We could add some in-between steps here. And it can jump to a halfway point on them, which can start getting interesting here. You get like almost a stop motion -y vibe. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, go to a curve, and this curve can be useful. We can really pull in the base. So a lot of the time, they're going to be a regular glass, but every once in a while, they can suddenly bend over, and we can pull this in a little bit more there. So we get that little transitional time, but you get burn, 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 burn. And so, yeah, just all, you know, just two plane effectors morphing between these two shapes. So, and that's using a random field, but instead of a random field, we could turn that one off. And we could just make something as simple as a linear field, which is more what I think we saw in that little video. If we have our linear field traveling on Z+, plus, uh, first of all, you see the color is working. I don't actually want the color to be turned on, so we can turn that off. But our linear field, I could just grab it, and then they're all down and go... And yeah, it's as straightforward and simple as that. And what's so cool about this and the way they're, that they're morphing is that we can just go back into the original one and change the morph however we want. We could taper these to be bigger and bulge them inward a little bit more, pinch it really thin. We have the bend, bend even further. A nice even 180 might be good, but let's try 270 just to be goofy. Yeah, look at that. Now they can bend all the way over. So that, you know, it just starts layering up and it's really fun in the way that these kind of things can combine. And man, yeah, I don't, I can't even go into it, all the crazy ways that these types of things might end up combining. Pretty cool, though. And then, like I said, like right now we're driving this via these deformers, but we could have also built a morph. We could have put a pose morph on it and then driven that with a pose morph deformer, and that could be deforming via a pose morph slider traveling upward and downward between those two states. So a lot of stuff is pretty cool. Let's go ahead and give that one a quick save, and I think we have time for one more question. Um... What do I even call that one? Uh, uh, modify clone, I guess. Back to the questions. Chattel. Chattel Abo. Chattel Abo? Uh, what do you got? Uh, ooh, that one's dangerous. I, I want to click the link, but it says uh, Medieval Fantasy City Generator. That's a dangerous thing. Oh, I've been I've been on the site before because you know I've I've run D and D games and I always like generating maps. And I at one point was working really hard on making a uh, a city generator, or I was trying to make a generator for my maps, and I ended up being able to turn it a little bit into a tool. We never ended up getting to release it because I didn't get to finish it, but it had some pretty cool stuff. And uh, yeah, this is going to generate you know, completely procedurally and randomly generate different cities with different options. We click on options here and, you know, 
going to be the hatching lines, towers, buildings, is their water. And yeah, it's just going to randomly go through. So it's really cool. Um, fun things you can do. And even as you mouse over, you can see like the different, it's naming different neighborhoods, the temple, South District. Like, man, it's really cool. Um, you are saying, how do you create a similar <laughs> random set of buildings like this? Um, um, well, the problem is that a lot of this is generating polygons and then randomly subdividing them afterward. I've done code that does certain things like this, but honestly, if I had a easy answer for that, I would have already been selling it as a tool because this kind of stuff is really, really fun. The way, um, having said that, I'll give you, I mean, I don't have an automatic way of doing it, but there are some... There are some techniques that I found were pretty useful. The basic one being, imagine if you just fill a shape. Let's just make a, a, a nice end side here. And I'm going to put that into a loft. What am I doing? Uh, I'll make a loft, turn that into geometry. And if we turn on NB, you can see what we've got. I'm going to change that to be N-Gons, make this editable. And now we've just got this one N-Gon here. It's even facing the wrong direction. I hit UR to invert that. But if we use the knife tool here and we started doing some cuts in various ways, I could cut there, and we could cut like that, and then maybe this one I'll cut through there, and then that one I'll cut like that, and then here we'll do one more cut that way. Actually, I don't like the way that one traveled to the middle, so we'll travel to... Oh, it doesn't want that midpoint, so let's just we'll hit Enter and Escape. Whoa, that's weird. Um... Okay, let's just do a series of single line cuts. Fine. Be like that. I've never gotten my head completely around the way the new knife tool works. But anyway, you can see I'm just doing some nice subdivisions here. So let's just say that's like our base geometry. So we can take that and, hit and uh, say I for inner extrude and then do an inner extrude, turn off preserved groups, and now you can see I can pull that in. And now we've got like some neighborhoods. And I hit UP to split that off. I'm going to even hit delete to get rid of that. So now we've got roads. And now I've got like these little neighborhoods. And now I could once again grab the knife tool and we could do some manual cuts if we wanted to. So K, K for knife. And we can go to individual ones and say, okay, chop that one or chop that one, or chop that one. But we can also just right click and say subdivide. And I can see we get those subdivisions and I can subdivide again. And you know, some of these are, like this one was uh, based on the cut I did, it was kind of triangular, so that's a little dangerous. I can undo on that one. Let's uh, subdivide and I can see, well, it still makes triangles, whatever, I'm gonna ignore it. So subdivide, and I can see we've got these smaller shapes but now I could go and like select all, shrink my selection, invert my, well, like I could shrink the selection, hit delete, and or split them out, I guess, UP for del that, delete, and now we've got these interior ones, so it's like the interior courtyard areas, and then you get these outer ones, and those become these outer potential little building shapes. You have to get a lot fancier if you wanted to get more detail on there, but even based on that, I could now select all these, hit the letter D for extrude, click and drag to do an extrusion on them, but we can turn off preserved groups and then start adding in some height variation here. And there we go. You can now see that we get some cute little varied heights on buildings. Delete the fong tag. And now you've got, you know, some actual little buildings and roads. And you can just kind of go through here and start going step by step by step and adding in additional extra details. So I have tinkered a lot with this kind of stuff, building them myself or building little rigs. It can be really fun and really satisfying, but um, but there's not a lot of super duper automatic ways of, of going nuts. Um, I hope to maybe in the future have some fun stuff along those lines, but for right now, uh, nothing immediately jumps to mind, but applying a couple materials, a couple fun little details on here, even this, you know, and, and it really just keeps on going because we got this, but we can say, you know what, let's split those roofs off. And then I, I still have the original ones, but now I can hit, uh, we can randomly deselect some of these. So I'm going to erase out a bunch of them. And I hit in I for inner extrude, and then we can hit D for extrude. And now we can give some second floors to some of these. Um, or 
uh, or I can hit I for inner extrude very carefully and then do a D for extrude and go down a little bit and now we get like these little oh actually I guess we'd have to hit D for extrude to go up first then I then D and now you can get these little some of these have these little ledges on the roof depending on how far you want that to go and those all randomly were pushed up and down and you start introducing all this extra little detail on them and some of them can get extra subdivisions um, I didn't select all these super, uh, I guess there's a split off one. I should have been doing that extrusion on this, but if I grabbed a couple of those uh, randomly, we could subdivide those and then randomly deselect some of them. And now some of these can get partial second floors. So, you know, well, once again, detail, you can just go and add and add and add and add, and we still have these roads going. So it's, it's fun. Um, I'm not going to bother saving this one either because this final result isn't much. But the techniques are really, really fun. Uh, Daryl, can you get fields in R19? No, you cannot. Uh, fields are R20. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, yeah, I mean, different Greeblers can give you different... Um, different Greeblers could definitely give you different effects here overall. Um, pushing things, I would love to have pushed things further here. And like I said, I was working, I wrote 5,000 lines of code to do some really fancy stuff, but we ended up never being able to do anything with it. Um, so who knows, but man, I am all about procedural generation of this kind of thing, like being able to parametrically generate things. Um, ooh, Viking, how do dynamically rig trees that seems unlikely let's see what we got here it looks like this instagram is still uh not running fully yeah instagram is not working on pc right now so that link just does not work too bad uh We're going to do that using MoGraph by feeding some buildings in as elements. Um, yeah, I mean, if we're going back to this building thing, the um, you're going to end up with like a lot of intersections. There's no good way of stopping things from intersecting. That's one of the big challenges because you see games like City Skylines, which I absolutely love, but the um, we don't have any way of subdividing things in a very, very clean way. So you can see how you know we, if we had this original spline or any kind of road spline going. We can, on a road-by-road road basis, potentially feed something through. But let me even open, put that into a new file. So you get something like this, and then you're like, okay, well, I want to have a series of buildings traveling around. So let me make a rectangle, and let's go ahead and make this really clean. I'm going to go 20 by 20, and we're going to put that into an extrude. So it pushes upward. Let's even just make it a square. And so you do something like that, and we say, okay, cool, we're going to clone it around, but we don't want it directly on the road, so we're going to put it into a null, and then I'm going to scoot it uh, 20 units backwards. Cool. So we go into a cloner, and we put that into the cloner. And, and I, I this is actually something I have spent a lot of time doing this kind of stuff, so I can speak with some authority on this. So you can see that we're traveling around. Um, it looks like our... I guess the orientation wrong. So this one shouldn't be negative 20 on Z. It should be negative 20 on X. And now you can see we are off to the side and it is uh, flipped upside down. So we could put a rail spline in there or we can, can we reverse the spline? No. Oh, well, okay. Turning on and off did it. Sounds weird. Oh, nope. Reverse. Okay, well, reversing the spline does do it. So you can see now that we're cloning buildings boom, 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 off to the side. So they're a little bit away from the road. And we can increase the count and say, okay, as long as we keep our count even, then these are all working. But then imagine if you wanted some of these buildings to be bigger. If I were to copy that and hit T for scale and start scaling up and get a bigger building, there's nothing that stops it from intersecting with everything else near it. And yes, I mean, you can go and do um, the push apart, but the push apart in no way actually solves this problem in an intelligent way. This is a very, very brute force method. Let's do scale apart. 
is a very brute force method, which is merely checking to see if something is in the radius of something else. So the fact that these are different sizes in no way is actually influencing if they're touching each other. So the push apart factor is just not helpful at all if you're trying to build this in some sort of accurate way. So once you started building up a collection of different size buildings that do different things, there's nothing to stop this from just straight up intersecting and colliding with itself. So if you're trying to have the buildings avoid each other, I've got nothing for you. There's no way of doing that. Um, now you could just straight up ignore it. I can go and change this to random, and now they're going to be randomly being generated along. And I can say, okay, cool. Now these are kind of like intersecting, but then it just becomes cooler looking buildings. And if that's neat to you, then boom, that automatically works. That's a fine method. And then this is uh, this is like a cloner outside of street, and then we could copy it and then we can go to transform and we can flip it 180 and now we've got the inside of the street and those will also be intersecting each other and this corner will not be taken into account so we get these weird angles colliding and in general maybe this being on the inside of the street maybe we want slightly fewer or what might be a good idea on both of them is to change the count to uh, a step so it's doing a one every certain number of steps but once again you don't know what size it's going to feed through so you can't anticipate that um, this is just going to keep a slightly more even scale going around. So you can see that, you know, we get those breaks on the corners, but not in between. We might want to go more or less, but this could go a long way. Like that might look neat and you're like, okay, cool. I don't mind the intersections. Like, you know, you can go ahead and turn on the edges and be like, okay, I can, I can work with that or add in some random effectors, uh, and let those scale up a little. Keep in mind that we're pivoting from a very specific spot. So doing some scaling here, we, in fact, we don't even need uniform scale. We can say it can go back randomly, go up randomly, go down randomly. And so all those are happening. We just don't have any intelligence built in. It's a very brute method, but we still have a fairly effective road that seems to be traveling through there all right as a general rule. So yeah, what can I tell you? There's not uh, there's no smart way right now of automatically doing that. There's no dynamic detection of anything. There's no built-in scale here. There's no push apart effector that has a different clones have different scales variable. Wish there was, but there's not. Hmm. So this is what you are. Well, you just want those to, hmm, I'm, I continue to be a little bit confused. Um, I know you, you've got this nice visual put together for me. But you want those to turn into additional surface area? Like, like if there's supposed to be a splash or they're supposed to morph into it. So you've already got displacing a little bit. And I did an entire tutorial back in the day for doing this type of displacement and getting the uh, shape going. But like at a certain point, wouldn't you just take what you're doing there and turn it to a volume? Like, isn't that the solution? Like, there's no automatic. I mean, mathematically, I guess you could calculate volumes. But wouldn't it be as, isn't that conceptually and you tell me where i'm wrong here if i were to make a rectangle we're going to just do this from the zero ground plane again extrude well let's extrude those up 50 units and the basic idea here being if we make what's the best way to do it visually because we're going to be faking it so um this might be fun what's the best way Actually, okay, yeah, this is pretty straightforward. I'm going to make a, it's not straightforward, but it's a nice simple rig. Uh, let's go ahead and make a straight line. And we're gonna make it zero and zero. And then we're gonna make it taller, a thousand. And then I'm going to make a sphere and we're going to clone onto it. And let's make our radius 25. And I'm going to clone onto an object. And the object will be the helix. And then we can set a rate. So I'm going to do a, a rate on here and hit play. And now they're traveling. I want them to go backwards. So I'll say a negative rate. Ding, 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 ding. So they're traveling downward. And But what's cool about this rig is as soon as they go down in the ground, they're actually hitting the bottom and then jumping back up to the top. And if I wanted to make this super precise, I could jump this up um, 25 units on the uh, helix spline. So if we type in 25 there, it's going to jump up that little bit. And now these are going to sink in. And it just looks like we have this infinite flow of them going down. And then what's cool about this rig is now we can go and add a random effector. And yeah, and I don't want to go random on Y, but we can push these out. You know, uh, how far? I don't know. 444, 444. Four, four, four. Nope, too much. 222, 222. Two, two, two. 
And now we have this endlessly falling, oh, apparently Y is fine, but Z is not. Yeah, there we go. So now, oh, one, 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 one. So now we just get this endlessly falling cascade of spheres falling in, which is fun. And the basic idea here for me would just be that we would, well, I'm going to use signal because it's going to be the quick way of doing it, but I'm going to drive this movement vector on here. So it starts out at 50, but I'm going to say I want it to start at 50, but then go up to 100. So now we should see this growing. So it's going to go up um, and whatever amount we want to go up. So let's go to 60, which is less. We're going to have that transition be relatively quick. And how often are these striking the ground? That's an important variable here. Um, how many clones do we have? We have 10, and the rate is negative 19. Oh, man, I don't know what the math on this is. 10, 25. One fifth of our timeline, one fifth of a second. These are three seconds. I there's a blah 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 blah. I don't even know. I'm just gonna guess. Um, so these probably need to go. Let's see. I'm gonna just calculate. So we've got one there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay, fifteen. Every fifteen seconds, it needs to suddenly grow that amount. Bloop. And now I'm gonna set this to additive. So now hopefully it's going to go bloop, 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 bloop. And every time it's going up higher and higher and higher. And then so that you've got your drops of water going in. And then we make our MoGraph. Not MoGraph. Uh, our geometry builder and our geometry mesher. And we'll just drop both of those into the builder and then both into the mesher. We'll keep it nice and low poly here. And hit play. And then we get blob, blob, blob. Blob, and then this is just going to keep on raising up as blobs. So, like I said, I feel like I'm missing something with your descriptions, but based on what you're saying, where you just want a drop to transform into the raising level, that's all I can get from it. Um, do, 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 do. I, I like uh, all the everybody's getting lots of questions here at the end. Um, let me see if any seem particularly intriguing. Um, espresso question: Is there a way to repeat a complicated espresso rig on multiple objects without copying the espresso tag over and over again? Yeah, iteration concept. Confusing part is when there's multiple objects via iteration at the end set another set of multiple objects should be affected uh, I don't have a super great answer for that um, essentially you're kind of answering the question yourself there which is yeah do you can you if you make a complicated espresso rig can you avoid copying the espresso rig again and again you just want you just want one of the rigs and yeah then it turns into usually iteration where you can be feeding things through like an object list it tends to be a pretty good way um, that, that, and we don't have a specific example here, so it's going to be hard to conceive of one. But making a, feeding feeding a whole bunch through a list, you can make an object list and drag in a bunch of objects and have it affect it in some way, and then make a second object list and feed it through that one, have it iterate through that one as well. So building it all in one Expresso rig is probably a good idea because what happens is you end up making a change to one Expresso rig, which means you need to make the change on the second Expresso rig. But that second one had custom things because it's feeding in the custom objects as well. So building it on the one big one is a better idea and doing it via iteration is a good way to do it. Um, blurp, blurp, blurp. Now I'm gonna give this one a quick save. Blurp. Um, ba, 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 ba. Uh, Viking, you have the link to dynamic tree rig. Let's go ahead and give it a quick look. Uh, before I do, I'm going to do a quick shout out right here for uh, the Patreon that I have set up. Uh, this live stream is brought to you by all the supporters on Patreon. Thank you so much, everybody, for supporting the stream. And it makes it so I can do this every week and make more tutorials. I want to do a special shout out to The Great Wanderer Studios, who's a super supporter on 
Rocket Lasso Lowe's Patreon. And I'm just going to click this quick little ad here, and I'll be right back, and we'll do the last one. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me here. Yay! So, yeah, um, if you're not already familiar with the perks and whatnot, if you're watching on Twitch, just below there's a link over on the Patreon. You can see if anything on there is neat for you. You can get some scene files and whatnot, so that, that hopefully is some good incentive. And there's a bonus stream that happens every Thursday um, if you're at the technician level or above. But in any case, let's go ahead and click on this one last link to the YouTube link of the tree question. Wow! Boom! <laughs> Look at that. Um, that's super crazy. Look at that. Um, whoa, I like that explosion too. Uh, this is pretty, <laughs> the uh, tutorial I'm going to be releasing is doing some stuff, uh, along these lines, actually. It's going to be a collapsing ground, but in a pretty art directable way. So that is pretty cool. Who made this? Um, is that who made it? The, uh, MPG core. Um, but that's pretty cool. I love that, uh, striking the ground and the way they are uh, making that fly up in the air. Probably some wind and the effector where it's being flung up. I'm not sure, but yeah, I'm pretty curious on that. But in any case, that's not your question. Um, you had a very specific question on these trees. Is that the only part? Boom, shaking. So you're asking about a quick way of rigging trees. I mean, I guess we need a tree example. It's really cool, though. Um, we need a example of the... Uh, like, uh, depending on the model, is going to highly change the way I would approach it. Um... The motion that was happening there was very straightforward, so there are potentially opportunities to do it in a relatively straightforward way. But I'm not, well, presumably you could, you know, there's a single tree. You rig up one tree. Let's see if we can find a still. So you could, you know, this is all the same tree again and again and again, just scaled. Uh, or if you're going, you know, crazy, you could make two or three of them. Um, individually, you'd have to select a, a whole series of branches and then associate them with, um, probably with just, a, a, if you're going to do the simplest way, just associate them with a joint, which is not that difficult. So let's go ahead and just do the joint setup really quick. But I don't have an example tree to go and do it by, but I could, I could, I don't think it would be that hard if you can select all of them. So let's just make the, what I consider to be the complicated part, honestly, and that's just, um, come on, brain, joints. We're going to make a series of joints. So we're going to make a single joint here. We're going to make a child. Let's going to go ahead and pull that out 100 units. And make a child, and let's point that upward. So let's just say, like, the trunk of our tree just goes really high, so we're going to move that up. Let's go 300 units total. And then you get your first branch. So actually, this tree would continue, so it's like, okay, there's going to be some... That's where one branch is. This is where some more are. But honestly, I don't even think we have to go that far. That, that is a branch right there. So let's just say there's a branch going right there. And then there's another unrelated branch which is over here. And then you also have, you know, so you have various branches over, but um, I got to keep in mind that we can't pivot from there. So I actually have to, I'm going to make a duplicate of this one as itself, as a child, and then we'll make a child there. And now that one, you know, we can be arbitrary there. We can copy that one. And then this one, I can go and move that one up in the air. And then wherever that second branch goes. So you just go and do this for everywhere that there's a branch. 
and you just make sure you're kind of following all of those. And uh, and and based on what we saw in that sh the nice little short there, is we we don't need to worry about every tiny little sub branch. You can if you want, but that that animation I don't think would call for a very very complicated series of additional ones. But just saying, if you wanted to, you could also make longer joint chains here that could actually be following further along. But having done that, if we were to just um, you know, if each of those is one of the branches, then we could really easily bind these to those branches by selecting all those polygons, selecting these branches, and say, bind to that one. And then here, I'm pretty sure we can just add in a, let's just add in, we'll just do it on one of them and see if it works. We're going to add on a IK, an IK um, joint right there. And I'm going to say that it ends right here. That there's no goal, none of this stuff. And all I really care about is um, dynamics. So let's enable the dynamics, and let's see if uh, the first object can be affected, because we might need this to be a longer joint chain for that to work. I'm not sure. But the basic idea would be, yeah, that's not triggering yet. So does it need a goal to be able to do that? I don't think it would. But you never know. It's still not going. So let's go ahead and... Give it another joint on there. Just I, I want to see how far we have to go until we actually see an effect. Oh, yeah. And I had a goal here, so that kind of breaks that. There we go. Um, well, let's see. That seems to do something now. So if we were to grab our dynamics and really go easy on the stiffness. Is there gravity? Uh, forces? Gravity. Don't worry about gravity. So with no, there's no gravity. So this just cares about being in its any given position. So if this suddenly, if suddenly there was an explosion and this went boom, uh, well, it's not, uh, maybe me dragging it is forcing a refresh. In fact, I think that's a thing. If you go to dynamics, it has continuous update. I'm going to turn that off and let's see. There we go. So now you can see when I go boom, boom, you can see there's actually like a little bit of a reaction there and you can, you know, with different settings, we could go and put a bunch of drag on there and with any luck, if that suddenly shot up and went down, it's going to get left behind. So you can get this very straightforward type of rig where you can start getting reaction. Uh, position hold, rotation hold, that might be how I, it's trying to get back quickly. Um, okay, well, that behavior's a little strange. Is it position hold or rotation that did that? Well, apparently it's position, so let's go easy on the rotation. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, so the position hold, I don't know, it's trying to, it's trying to get back to its position. But we might need there to be some reasonable deformations on there. Um, getting, yeah, so designing one little, I shouldn't have made all these other branches until we had one working. We could copy and paste it a bunch of times. But you can hopefully see that we can just, you know, we could, if this is playing, we can animate that to go up and down and get it to lag behind. Um, and honestly, making a very short joint chain would be a good idea. That should be what we did in the beginning, honestly. Let's start, get rid of all those. And let's make that one be uh, 100 away. And let's just make a whole chain of them. Grab all of them. And we'll make all of these be 100 units away. Boom! We get a joint chain. And then we go and we take this one and we'll zero it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's keep it nice and simple. So let's just say that's one of our branches. And then we're going to go ahead and add a character, IK chain. We're going to make sure that it's going to the end point. And then if we have play, nothing happens. But if we turn on dynamics, then it should go floop and flop over. We can say no continuous update, and we can get rid of gravity. So now it's just trying to stay straight there. But now if I were to move it up and down, you see we're going to get this nice overlapping animation. So if there suddenly was an explosion where this shot up and went down, you're going to get that little flapping automatic overlaying up, you know, motion. It's constantly trying to get back to its original position. And without any gravity, then it's doing a fine job of um, returning to its original position. So binding this to one of the branches would be pretty trivially easy. And you don't even need the root. You could just be like, that's one branch. Like, you can even just say null and you're, you call this tree rig and then all you do is put this one joint wherever let's see so that's where the tree is um i don't have the happy model toolbox here i wonder if we have something uh inside of like broadcast we had all the 
uh, 3D objects? Do we have anything? Vegetables? Is there broccoli? No, sadly not. Yeah, I don't have a tree. Um, but, okay, okay, okay. What's the quickest? We'll use a figure. There we go. So there's our figure. So let's just say, like, that's a branch, that's a branch, and this head is a branch. So um, we have our pivot in the same place that the tree is. So now we can just grab this one rig, and I'm going to move it to wherever I need to. So let's go ahead and move it directly to his elbow. Oops. Um, oh, that's interesting. The uh, We might have to turn off dynamic while we're establishing where it goes. So I'm going to move that there. And let's go ahead and rotate that to the end point. I'm going to T for scale and scale it so it just matches the arm. And now let's go ahead and duplicate that entire rig and move it to the opposite position. And I'm going to spin it around. And now let's go over here, and they're both too low. We'll grab those, pull them both up into the air. And let's make one more. And this one we're going to move into his head. And we're going to go to a front view. And move it up to his neck. R for rotate. Let's spin that up. In fact, we could probably zero that out. So we'll say 90, 90, nice and clean. And then T for scale again. And even with it being really long, um, that's fine. We can also delete out additional joints by trying to do as quick as possible. So then, there we go. We just have three different series of joints so we can have those be uh, bonding to different parts of the mesh. If I were to grab his mesh, I'm going to put in a connect object and make it editable so it's all welded down into a single one. And uh, it can get a little, let's see, I don't want to lose it. But my thought is, what if we, I'm going to make one final joint here but i don't want the tag i just want these two joints right here because what i want to do is just grab their entire character and grab these three those two joints and bind the entire thing to that so if i said um character manage uh character command bind then now what should have happened is we've automatically linked everything to just this one joint the entire thing is on that so wherever this joint goes everything goes okay that's all good but now we can go in and start adding in our additional joints so i might pop that out to be its own manager and let's go ahead i haven't done this in a while but if we drag these additional joints in there grab those and grab our character there should be some sort of how do we pop open the uh Here's the weight tool. There's a brush. Or do we invert everything else? Nah, let me think. Let me think. It's not complicated. I just don't have the steps in my head at this moment. Um, I want to. I want to essentially automatically bind these again. And I thought there's a way to do it. Because right now they're not bound. Somebody's saying shift click the vertex map. I mean, that's not a vertex map for one. That's uh, the weight manager. Although I just shift clicked and double clicked the weight manager and then that popped open, I think the weight manager I was actually looking for. So thank you for the shortcut. I was gonna go pop that open manually, but now we have auto weight. Um, so if I select, I don't know if it's only based on the joints I select, but what I wanna do is select all those new ones we just added in. Apparently, I added the ones in for his head. But if I grab those, and the orange, yeah, orange is not it. So these are the ones. We should have named them. But if I select those, my hope is if we hit uh, calculate, then it, oh, no, it bound everything. Uh, we can say selected. Oh, there we go. Look, selected points. Nice, nice, nice. That's what we want. So if this was a tree branch, remember I was saying, if this is the tree, tree branch, you would select uh, all the branches you want. We select those. I'm going to shift click and turn them into points. So now we can say uh, selected points only. So now, based on the weights we currently have selected, which are those, we can say auto weight, and now that has gotten colorized based on that. And now we can go ahead and kind of do it on all of them. So let's go ahead and go to joints and add in our other cluster here. Uh, apparently we can't apply it via that, so let's go ahead and pop that one out again. And let's go ahead and drag in these joints, and now those have been added as well. That would probably be a good idea to rename that one. Let's just start with X. 
and end with X. Then we can go into these and select those. And now we can see where those live and the colors that they are. So once again, we want the selected points. So here you would be selecting your tree. You grab all the leaves and all the branches of that relevant part, select them, you know, uh, if it's our one mesh, it wouldn't work, but I hit UW and I'm gonna convert it to points holding on shift. And now we can again hit calculate and now that arm has been bound exactly to those. Very nice. And we'll just do the step one last time. And like I said, this is a little bit of a pain now, but if you only had to do it one time on one tree, then that, this isn't that bad actually. Uh, so now that's in there. We need to just do them. We'll just finish off our process here. Let's go ahead and select these UW, hold down shift. And then we will go into joints and make sure we have everything below X selected, auto weight. Nice. And now let's just make sure that our original one, yep, our original one is still controlling everything else. Perfect, perfect. And then usually the last thing I do is select everything. Actually, let's not, well, I don't want to do it on a joint by joint basis. The head is fine, but usually I like blurring these. So I grab all these and we can go to uh, mode, joint, weights, commands. Here, we go to commands and I'm going to say uh, apply selected. We can say smooth. And I'm going to say apply selected, and it's going to blur all of them, and you just get a smoother transition between them. And I would do them in, in the clusters of relevant joints. So we grab that, and then I can say apply selected, apply selected, and I smooth it out twice. It should just make it a little smoother. So anyway, uh, we didn't check how well these were wiggling, but with any luck, if we hit play, well, now we should be able to grab these and enable the dynamics again. And you see there's that little pop right there when it's trying to initialize them. But... Um, we should probably save this. Boom. Uh, now we should be able to hit play. And now we can go boom. Oh, no. Let me uh, grab the ring. We can go. <laughs> Wee! Noodly arms. <laughs> so, yeah, that's where. <laughs> That's working well. Uh, there's a lot of joints in a very short distance on that the head-based one. Renaming that head would probably be a good idea. Um, but we can go into that one and go to the dynamics and you know increase the strength. Um, we can grab the drag on all of them. Add a lot more drag. The rotation hold. The curves and the forces. I mean, there's a lot of different settings in here that would enable making these a little bit more detailed, a little more controllable. But in any case, you know, we now have, we can now have the tree explode upward and react and slowly return or more quickly return. And hopefully you saw there that if you're doing this kind of basic rigging, it's not, it's not that complicated. Like we set up that very basic thing and then we just bind different parts to it with the auto tools and smooth them out a little bit. And, um, you know, it's not amazing, but that's not bad for how quickly we just did it. The head definitely needs to, to be chilled out. Honestly, it probably should have had the same number of joints as everything else did. So just shrinking that down was a bad idea. We should have just chopped that down like two or three joints. Would have been good. But, uh, yeah, rotation hold might be good. I'm not sure I'm not sure what is the setting. Yeah, rotation hold is, is brutal. But position hold, yeah, I'm not sure what setting. We can change the way these are applied, but. I think that is going to officially wrap this one up as our little tree character flies away. Goodbye, everyone. So, yeah. I mean, that was fun. That was a weird one. But uh, it's always fun being able to sneak in a little bit of riggings along along the way every once in a while. So we'll give that a save. Um, Let's see. Once again, thank you, everyone, for supporting on Patreon. Thank you, everyone, for coming in here and asking questions. I couldn't do it if there weren't fun questions to answer. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's cool that that was the final question. Uh, or seeing those explosions there because let's see if I have uh, – let me see if I can pull up a little preview for you of the upcoming tutorial. I'm still putting on some tweaks here. But where is it? Where is it? Tutorial. Dynamics, breaking ground, renders, finals. Here we go. Um, so here is a quick render of some of the results of what the tutorial gets you through. So this is all built in the tutorial. So you get this nice collapsing, the secondary stuff, the chunks falling away, some displacement going, the cracks revealing. You can see we've got these extra cracks anticipating, chunks randomly moving up and down. And the fun part about this is 
these chunks are not dynamic at all. None of these chunks are dynamic. There are dynamics running, but the dynamics are running on the ground and not on these chunks. So there's a lot of really fun info in there, but it looks like the tutorial tutorials can be like two and a half hours long to get through all of these parts. So it's not trivial stuff, but I am quite pleased. I think that looks pretty cool. I'm still doing a couple little tweaks on it, but yeah, that should hopefully be out sometime next week. So just a little preview of what you should be seeing soon. So I'm excited for that one. Uh, that will wrap this up. Thank you again, everybody. And I'll see you for the secret stream tomorrow if you're following on Patreon. And I'll see you next week, if not, on the next Rocket Lasso Live. So thank you, everybody. And uh, I'll see you later. And on the Slack. Don't forget, go join the uh, Rocket Lasso Slack channel by going to rocketlassoslack.com, where you can continue the conversation, ask questions, people help out, cool projects, all sorts of good stuff. Um, so, yeah, that will do it. Bye-bye, everybody. See ya.